place. Now I'd like to introduce Janice Parker for you. I first met her giving one of the suicide talks at my work that I have to go through as a nurse. And I asked her probably a year and a half ago, hey, would you come talk at my church? And she said yes. And then, what, what, November this year, I called her up and I said, I'm calling in that favor. <laughs> So she said, I've been committed for a year and a half. So anyway, please welcome Janice Parker as she comes and talks to us about this subject. As Lori mentioned, um, we did do lectures at... We did do lectures. <laughs> Thank you. As Lori mentioned, we did do lectures at Borges Ascension Hospital on suicide as the Joint Commission has heightened its um, endeavors to make hospitals safe from where people commit suicide. And so we learned about suicide and what, what kinds of thoughts go through a patient's mind. Um, we, um, I really appreciate you inviting me here today. Um, I would like to know, let you know that um, I would like you to raise your hand and make comments at any time. I'm easily distractible. <laughs> and so you can um, interrupt me for questions. And um, I just want you to know that um, this is a tough subject, and I'll try to be kind with your heart, as I would expect you to be as well. And if it does become uncomfortable for you, if the just talking about suicide makes you uncomfortable, it won't hurt my feelings if you get up and step up. Okay, so today we're going to talk about how the brain affects behavior. We're going to talk about risk factors for suicide some of the trends in suicide, and suicide as a public health crisis right now. We're going to talk about adolescents, and we're going to talk about older adults specifically, and then we're going to talk a little bit about how substance abuse um, has to do with um, suicide. So, there are three areas of the brain that play a part in suicidal thinking. And part of the brain that is affected is the amygdala, which is located in the back of the brain here. And the amygdala is where we have our instincts. And it's the most developed and clearly functioning area of the brain. And when that part of the brain is stimulated, it says to the person, warning, warning, danger. Kind of like primitive man walking in the forest and seeing a tiger. It's that kind of an alarming, um, anxiety-producing thing. The function of it is to get you to think about what you're going to do to keep from being eaten by a tiger. Okay? And um, we think that we have the idea that we do rational thinking um, in the thinking part of our brain, but it actually most commonly comes from the emotional area of the brain, which is in the hippocampus, another part of the brain. And um, we, in order to, um, to get to a point where you can think rationally, you have to have the communication with other people. When it gets to the hippocampus, the only way that you can process these thoughts rationally is if it goes to the prefrontal cortex, which is our thinking part of the brain. Is that good? Can you hear me? Okay. Okay. <laughs> so the only way we can do this is to communicate with other human beings. And then once we do that, then we can start thinking rationally about what's going on. Well, with the suicidal person, the thoughts stay in the amygdala, and they go warning, warning to the hippocampus. What am I going to do? Warning, warning. Hippocampus, what am I going to do? And they get stuck there. And they can't go to the part in your brain that does the normal rational thinking, which is the prefrontal cortex, which is right here in the middle of your forehead, behind your forehead. That's where we make rational decisions. And that's where somebody with suicidal thoughts is not able to get to, okay? Um, when it gets to the hippocampus, it says, whoa, what am I feeling? And then when it gets to the prefrontal cortex, that's the executive center of the brain where we take over and do rational things. 
So the ancients used to call this point on the forehead um, the point of thought, okay? They called it the third eye. And sometimes you'll see pictures of a face with a third eye there. And how they figured out that that kind of thinking happened in the forebrain is beyond me, but they did. Ancient people knew that this is where our center of thinking was. And they did a study on some monks, and they did MRIs on the monks, and they lit up the um, amygdala, and then they lit up the hippocampus, and they expected that without talking to another human, which monks don't do, that they would go back and forth between the amygdala and the hippocampus, just like the rest of us. And what happened is they were able to go right steadily to, through the hippocampus and light up the prefrontal cortex without talking to another human being. So we have this propensity in us, either from our creator or something, to reach a point where you can bypass that emotional reason, region in the brain and go straight to the prefrontal cortex. Just an interesting study, I thought. Okay. Okay, I'm just going to go to the next slide. Okay, suicide can happen to anyone. Um, regardless of their age or their gender, um, they can... I can't do this. I'll have to just go through. Only people who have acquired the ability to overcome fear and pain that's associated with pain and death can complete suicide. Exposure to injury, pain, and danger makes people less afraid of a lot of things, including suicide. The CDC um, tells us there are usually at least 20 rehearsals before a person tries to commit suicide. Uh, practice or rehearsal behaviors come in the form of suicide attempts, suicide ideation, and deliberate self-harm. In 2006, they uh, figured out that um, young people were um, using up their rehearsals by playing video games. And the video games, would they would create what's called an avatar, which is a little character that looks like themselves. And they would go through the 20 rehearsals in the video game and suddenly be ready to end their life without anybody having a clue that they were having these rehearsals. And those are some clues that sometimes we can pick up on. And they were just doing it in the video game. They were killing themselves off in the video game. and increasing their, their bravery to commit suicide, and so we were losing young people in that manner. The risk factors for suicide, I'm gonna to have to take this back down to read. The risk factors for suicide include mood disorders. And mood disorders are the two bipolars. There are two kinds of bipolar. They both result in terrible depression and major depression. And these mood disorders cause people to have terrible depression. And the terrible depression causes them to have suicidal thoughts. And we know now that depression is the result of chemical imbalance. And when I tell patients that the suicidal thoughts are the most significant symptom of their illness and that it's not their fault that they're having suicidal thoughts, they almost always burst into tears because they are so relieved to know that it's not their fault that they're having these thoughts. It's the fault of the depression. And I know this because when we put them on antidepressant medication following suicidal thoughts, 
they get better in two or three days and the suicidal thoughts go away once the depression is being treated. So it's important to remember that they're not choosing to have suicidal thoughts. It's the condition of the chemistry of their brain that is actually causing those thoughts. If they have a history of attempting suicide in the past, they're at risk for suicide in the future. So we have to keep that in mind. If they have access to the means, if there are fire, firearms in the house, if they've been saving up pills, if they've been planning some sort of way to access a rope, all of that goes into suicidal thinking and risk factors. Then there's substance abuse. If somebody is engaging in increased substance abuse, they may be fighting with suicidal thoughts and trying to drown the suicidal thoughts out. Uh, chronic pain can cause depression and therefore suicidal thoughts. And a recent or a history of trauma can play on the brain and that amygdala and hippocampus back and forth and back and forth can happen with that. Um, if they have a recent or a history of trauma, then that's a risk factor. That's something that could impede their thinking and cause depression, which results in suicidal thoughts. And if there's a family history of suicide, that's a risk factor. For some reason, people never let go of the memory of someone who has taken their life. And they ask themselves, do I have that in me? Is that something that makes me want to end my life when really it's just the depression? And then they have changes in behavior. Maybe they become agitated. Maybe they become really slow in their movements and they don't interact with others and they isolate. Has anybody here ever had a crappy day? Well, this moving from the amygdala to the hippocampus to the amygdala to the hippocampus trap that people find their minds in is pretty much what we're going through when we're having a crappy day, okay? But for a suicidal patient, they feel like that all the time. And so they need some relief to get rid of the suicidal thinking, to break the isolation, and to start communicating with human beings again. These are some warning signs of suicide, and that is a direct threat of suicide. If somebody says, I'm going to kill myself, you better pay attention. If they say, all I want to do is go to sleep and never wake up, that's a very serious suicidal statement. Um, if they go to the doctor's office and say, no, I'm not going to need another appointment, thank you. Okay, or you won't have any problems with me soon. Those kind of statements are really serious. Also, if they write threats of suicide is a serious warning sign. Uh, if they get, become aggressive or agitated in their behavior, that's a warning sign. If they have dramatic mood changes. We had a patient when I worked at the state hospital that um, had um, schizophrenia and she was very depressed about being schizophrenic. She was in her late 20s and uh, she had been on suicide watch off and on through the years that we took care of her. And then one weekend she went home with her parents and she had the kind of schizophrenia where she didn't um, take care of her eight activities of daily living, we call them, grooming and hygiene and that kind of thing. But she went home to her folks and she jumped in the tub and she washed her hair and she shaved her legs and her parents were elated to see her do this. You know, she never did that. <clears throat> and then she went to the fridge and she says, what's for supper, mom and dad? And she never ate with them before. Well, long story short, they brought her back at the end of the weekend and told me what a wonderful weekend they would had. It's the best weekend they'd had with her in years. And that was on Sunday evening, and on Monday morning, we found her hanging in her room dead. She wanted to provide her parents with this calm, appropriate, compliant daughter the weekend before she intended to end her life. And we had no clues. 
In hindsight, I was very disgusted with myself that I didn't recognize that moon change. But I didn't. So that's how that works. Talking or writing about death, we sometimes have people um, uh, text all their friends and family, everybody on their contact list, with a suicide statement. So then everybody is frantically looking for the victim and can't find them. And when we do get them, we get them on the unit, and we've literally saved their life. Um, impulsive or reckless behavior, the suicidal person says, I'm going to kill myself anyway. I think I'll drive the car 120 miles an hour down 131. That's the kind of behavior I'm talking about that they can engage in. That's the kind of thinking that's going on. Uh, seeking a method or weapon. Um, people actually look up on the internet for uh, um, a method to commit suicide. And unfortunately, the internet is full of suggestions. Um, they also may buy rope and secure it someplace or fill the tank on the car for whatever their plans are. So um, seeking a method or weapon, if you get a hint of that, it's very serious. And then finally, preparing a will, especially if it's a young person, kind of young to prepare a will. Not that it's not a good idea, but not a good idea when you're depressed and it should be a signal to us. Eminent um, signs are that the person would be putting their affairs in order and giving away possessions. So, Lori, this is my grandma's booby ring, and I, you're my best friend, and I want you to have it. No, really, I do, okay? That's the kind of thing that they do to make sure that their prized possessions go to whom they want it to go to. And then saying goodbye to family and friends, like the text I was talking about. That's an eminent danger sign. And this mood shifting from despair to calm that we saw with my patient at the state hospital. And then finally, seeking access to a method or a weapon by any means. They're desperate at this point to find something to harm themselves with. So these are some trends in suicide. Uh, nearly 50,000 people commit suicide in the United States each year. And when I did this first presentation for Lori three years ago, it was only 45,000. Then it went up to 46,000. And three years ago, I was teaching them that someone commits suicide every 16 minutes. Well, now it's every 12 minutes. It's an epidemic. Um, I had all the statistics in my notes, but I don't have them. But it's, it affects every age group. Everybody um, has um, looked at this, these suicide results, and we see trends in teenagers, and we see trends in older adults. Um, the most dangerous age is between 45 and 54, the, the people in that age group and their lives more than anyone else. More people kill themselves than kill each other. So the suicide rate is higher than the homicide rate in this country. And it has grown to be higher than the homicide rate among teenagers, which used to be one of the leading causes of their deaths. Overall, it's the 10th leading cause of death in the United States. The 10th leading cause of death. Attempts and um, completed suicides are difficult to track because you don't know on the birth certificate whether or not the death was intentional or not. So that makes getting the statistics just that much more difficult. And they suspect that the number of suicides recorded is way less than the number of suicides that actually occur. Stigma skews the suicide data. And by that I mean that the doctor will choose perhaps not to put suicide as the cause of death, but that their heart stopped or something like that at the uh, behest of the family that it not be part of the uh, death certificate. 
And um, people treat those who pass away from suicide sometimes very much differently um, in terms of their funeral arrangements and that kind of thing than somebody that dies from another cause. They figure that in the United States there are 500,000 attempts, but there's no real way to track that. There are emergency room visits that come under different categories and diagnoses, and it's hard to establish just exactly how many people have attempted or whether they even go to the emergency room following an attempt, and they figure that it might be twice that amount have attempted suicide. So the statistics are there, but they're kind of nebulous because you can assume that they're a lot higher than that. Um, suicide is a public health is issue. Um, the increase in suicides in this country this year actually decreased the life expectancy of adults in the United States. The, um, for 30 years, the life expectancy has steadily risen in the US, and they figure because of suicides, and opioid overdoses, which we don't know if those are suicides or not, um, the life expectancy has actually gone down by like 0 .003, which is a very small amount, but that's an impact that we've seen. Um, the public health people look at the crisis from a population viewpoint. How many people out of 100,000 um, would commit suicide or attempt? And that's how they look at it. And so um, all the states have gone up in their suicide rate except Nevada. And Nevada has always been the suicide capital of the world. And we're just all catching up with their level of suicide risk. So that's a disturbing statistic. And um, we in healthcare consider suicide in this country an epidemic. It's just way out of hand. It's just unimaginable the number of people who are ending their lives. We're going to talk a little bit about adolescents now. Um, the suicide rates for 15 to 19 year olds and those between 20 and 24 are at their highest levels since 2000. And that's where that um, internet thing, uh, the game playing kind of plays in. Um, we don't know why teenagers are doing this. Um, we're very concerned. We worry that it has lack of sleep, that it has to do with uh, uh, Facebook, that it has to do with bullying. Uh, we're just not really sure why it's happening. And the surge is particularly strong among teen boys that's up 14% um, between 2015 and 2017. And teenage girls have been steadily rising at 8% a year um, between 2000 and 2017. So the teens are definitely being impacted. We don't really know what is causing this. These are some adolescent risk factors. Um, depression and loss of uh, a friend or a relative. Um, conflict with a friend or a relative can cause them to become suicidal. Um, a history of abuse, exposure to violence, if they have had um, problems at school and been in fights and that kind of thing, or if they have been involved in some sort of a um, public um, violence um, issue, then that can make them have like a little bit of PS PTSD. If they're increasing their use of alcohol or drugs, if they're pregnant or they've contracted a, uh, an STD, a sexual transmitted disease, they can become suicidal. Um, bullying, they really worry that bullying is causing a lot of problems, especially in the younger teens, and that they see no way out, and they, do, they isolate, and then they um, end their lives. Um, sometimes they're having issues with their sexual orientation, they're uncertain. Um, they may have been bullied or teased at school about that, and that can lead to, that is a risk factor for suicide. 
and um, if they're exposed to suicide, like, um, I don't know, but I'm, I'm 67 years old, and when I was in high school, not one of the kids in my high school committed suicide. But now kids can tell you, oh yeah, I lost this friend, and this friend, and this friend. So they're exposed to something that we never even used to talk about. It was kind of taboo to talk about suicide. This is an interesting one. If the person has been adopted, they're at risk for suicide. And I do not understand the particulars of that, but it's just a statistic anyway. We're left to wonder. And then if they have a family history of a mood disorder or suicidal behavior. So the risks are very much like they are for everyone, but they're kind of specific to adolescents, including bullying. These are the warning signs. Talking or writing about suicide like we talked about. Withdrawal, mood swings, alcohol or drugs. Feeling trapped or hopeless, that's a very big deal with them. If they feel there is no future for them. And changing their routine. If it looks like they've do, they're doing something different than they have been doing routinely, that would be a warning sign that you would want to investigate. These are more warning signs, risky behavior. They'll do all sorts of uh, risky things, including driving too fast, um, climbing water towers and thinking about jumping. They just do risky things. They start giving away their belongings, just like the other folks who are challenged by suicidal thoughts. And their personality changes. They may have been vivacious and outgoing and gregarious. They become isolated and quiet and don't share their feelings. So this is what we should do. This is all um, kind of arbitrary because at the time, you may not know what to do. But these are some ideas of what you can do to help. Address the depression or anxiety. Are you feeling depressed? Are you feeling more sad than you do usually? Um, are you having thoughts of suicide? And it's okay to use the word suicide. And I know my daughter has a personality disorder that causes her to threaten suicide. She's 35 now. But since she was a young teenager, she has always threatened me with suicide. And um, I felt uncomfortable asking her if she was suicidal, just using that word. And I'm a psychiatric nurse, and I had trouble with that. Because when it's your own family, it's, um, it's very hard to even utter that word. But it's important. Get it out there. Let the teen express themselves. Well, yes, I am suicidal, and this is why. That's, what, that's the response that you want. Pay attention to them. Pay attention to their routine. Pay attention to what's going on in school. Notice if they come home from school despondent, feeling helpless and hopeless. It's important to investigate and to be part of their lives, which they don't want any part of. But it's up to us to do that. Discourage isolation. That's the most important thing. The more they isolate, the sicker they become, the more depressed they become, and the more intense the suicidal thoughts become. Encouraging a healthy lifestyle. Get them to eat right, sleep right, play right. Make sure that they do their homework and that they know that you care what happens to them. Support the treatment plan. If you do get your teenager help, make sure that you explain to them that it's going to take a while before you feel really well again. But at least you're doing the right thing, getting treatment and following through on your depression, which has the propensity to cause you to have suicidal thoughts, which are unnatural thoughts in human beings. And safely store firearms, alcohol, and medications. You don't want your kids to have access to firearms. Um, one of my dearest friend's 15-year-old son killed himself with a firearm, 15, in May. 
and um, it's just really important that you keep them locked up, key under wraps, or don't have them in your home at all. If you have prescription medications that can lead to an overdose, you need to keep those locked up and away from a teenager. If they can steal their parents' cigarettes, they're certainly going to steal their medicines if they're determined enough. And finally, um, keep your alcohol under wraps so that they don't become um, depressed from the alcohol and further complicate the suicidal thoughts and depression. So now we're going to talk a little bit about older adults. Does anybody have any questions about teen suicide before we go on? Okay, we're going to talk about older adults now. And I'm sorry about the small print, but I had to do this at home, and so <laughs> it's not real fancy. But more than 12,000 adults in the U.S. over the age of 50 die by suicide each year. And most of them suffer from a mood disorder, typically major depression. Okay, and what we find is that society almost understands when an older adult commits suicide, yet we're shocked when a teenager does. And they're all just as serious. People don't need to end their life whether they're young or they're old. They need support of other humans to keep that from happening to them. What becomes important when you are an older adult are what we call... Um, reasons for living and these are things that we assess in the hospital every time we do a suicide assessment and these are things that might help the person not commit suicide so that might be something like um, having children in the home um, having a strong relationship with a therapist um, being part of a, a marriage or a relationship um, all of these things are what we call protective factors. Now, they're not anything that we can rely on, but it gives us some idea if they lose a protective factor that they're going to kind of be lost. So we have to make sure that we identify what are the positive things in their life that would make them want to live. Now, some people don't have any joy in their life at all when they suffer from depression. And it's called anhedonia. And the hedonists were these Greeks that used to eat, drink, and be merry, and to party all the time. And they were joyful and exuberant in their lives. So anhedonia is having no joy in your life. Older people see their grandchildren that they adore, and it no longer gives them joy because they're in the depths of a depression. Okay? What can we do for the older adults? Well, we can look at their risk factors. Um, if they have a major psych disorder, that may be the reason that they have ended their life. So that's a risk factor. And that's more than just the mood disorders because people with schizophrenia are very dis, dis, um, depressed about having that debilitating illness and they know that it's debilitating and then it gets worse. And 10% of those who suffer from schizophrenia commit suicide. People with certain personality disorders that are filled with shame and um, they, nobody hates themselves more than these people with these particular personality disorders, they... Um, 10% of them commit suicide. So it's a high rate among the mentally ill. Okay? Uh, they may have major depression associated with suicide in later life. Um, they may live with relatives that are in regular contact, so it implies that it's not necessarily from elder isolation. Um, they may begin to misuse alcohol in combination with their psychiatric illness. And one third of all people who commit suicide are intoxicated or under the influence. So alcohol definitely blurs the lines and helps people to go into that further depression and end their lives when they would not have if they had been sober. 
Um, a medical illness can be a risk factor, family discord, I can certainly relate to that. I live in a three generation household. Sometimes grandma's just not um, consulted about things and that hurts my feelings. You kind of are a little displaced the older you get no matter what you're doing in the household. And so that discord can come sometimes cause depression, especially if it's long standing. Uh, financial trouble. Uh, physical disability, and unrelieved pain. There's something about chronic pain that causes depression, enables depression, and leads to suicidal thinking. And if you've ever suffered from chronic pain, it just grates on you. And that is a risk factor for suicide. And finally, loss and grief. Sometimes people can not just get through a grief period, and uh, they have suffered a loss and they just cannot imagine um, living their lives without their spouse. And sometimes that can lead to suicide. Sometimes not, because sometimes people intervene. We try to get that human sharing going so that the person can get to their prefrontal cortex, hopefully with the help of treatment and antidepressant medications, they can begin to think rationally again. Okay, and I just want you to know that people that are saved from suicide and come to our unit do well. They get on medication that makes the depression lift and makes the suicidal thoughts go away. So I can't impress upon you enough how important it is to get a suicidal person to the emergency room. There are trained screeners there that know exactly what to look for and what is dangerous and what is not and they can set up a safety plan loved one that will save their life and if they are admitted in one uh, inpatient to one north at Borges, uh which is the only psychiatric unit in Kalamazoo then um, they get help and they're supported and we watch them like a hawk until the suicidal thoughts have gone so that they cannot harm themselves while they're there with us So here are some warning signs in older adults. Loss of interest in things or activities that they usually found enjoyable. That's that whole anhedonia thing. Cutting back social interaction. And they kind of let up on the self-care and grooming. They just don't bathe as often as they did. And they look kind of scruffy because they don't have the energy to take care of themselves because of the depression and all the symptoms that probably Dr. Yesengaya Yeva talked to you about earlier that accompany depression. Um, they break medical regimens like going off their diets and stopping to take their prescription. Um, if they're experiencing or expecting to have a serious loss, maybe their spouse is terminally ill, um, this is a warning sign. If they feel helpless and or worthless, that's, that's a definite warning sign. And again, if they're putting their affairs in order and giving away things and writing a will, then that's something that you want to um, address and talk to them about. And then finally, if they're stockpiling medication or obtaining some other lethal means to end their life. So these are the things to do if you're um, helping an older patient. And they're exactly the same things that we do if we're helping a depressed teenager. Okay? We're going to address the depression and the anxiety. And we're going to use the word suicide. Are you contemplating suicide? It's important to establish that. If they are they need to go to the emergency room and be seen by a skilled screener who is adept at evaluating this and establishing what kind of help somebody needs to prevent them from ending their life. You need to pay attention to them. If they're an elder that lives alone, they need more frequent visits. They need to not isolate. Um, if they are doing that, you need to pay attention and ask them the suicide question and get them to the ER or to a therapist as soon as possible. It's really a medical emergency when somebody is saying that they are suicidal. 
because you should never leave them alone. You should take them immediately to the emergency room to be evaluated and save their life. It's not an easy thing. I'm just saying we should do it. Um, encourage a healthy lifestyle, eat and um, exercise and get plenty of sleep. Support the treatment plan. Sometimes people don't want to take pills. Well, this is a really important pill, an antidepressant. If it's going to keep you from becoming depressed and suicidal and ending your life. So they need to know not to stop taking it when they start feeling better, which is what very often happens. And within a few weeks, it leaves their system and they're back to being suicidal again. So you really need to support that treatment plan and compliance with those medications. And again, safely store firearms, alcohol, and medications, which if somebody's living alone, that's going to be kind of tricky because they take their own medications, yet they could stockpile them. So you have to review with them how are they managing their medications, maybe fill out the weekly um, pill boxes, and then take the remaining pills that someone might overdose to the house until next week when you have to fill the pill case again. These are just ideas. Does anybody have any questions about how to manage the older adult that's suicidal? Yes. What if uh, you have a person that doesn't want to go? <laughs> That's an excellent question. And sometimes you might need to call in assistance from others to um, try to convince them of the importance of it. Um, people that are suicidal are not in touch with how dangerous their decisions are going to be. And so you really have to get reinforcement from other friends and family. Tell the patient that we're not going to um, leave them alone until they do seek help, because the minute that you leave them alone, their risk doubles. Does that answer your question? It's not easy because they don't want to go. The depression makes them not even want to move. They don't even have the energy. You can call 911 and have them taken to the hospital because they can be petitioned to the hospital for um, the um, behavior of wanting to harm themselves. And we could get them help that way. Another thing that you can do is if you're at your house and you're worried about someone at their house, you can call the police to do a welfare check. And they will go to the home and check on the person. And if they're suicidal, the police will encourage them to go to the hospital. Was that helpful? Any other questions about suicide at all? Yes. In 1968, two weeks after I turned 10, um, went to my aunt's house. And at first, she couldn't find my grandfather. And she found him. And this has been in my head for such a long time. She came up the stairs screaming. And that has just been in my head. And it's affected me. Because I heard all that screaming and stuff. And I don't know if I should say how he did it, but... Yeah, and the thing, too, is she went down there and didn't see him at first. And then she went back down again, and he was, there were some pants hanging in the shower. She checked, and she came upstairs screaming. And that, it's, it's okay. It's, it's, it hurts. Yes, ma'am. I've tried. I've tried. I have tried a couple of times when I was, like, 19. And I have, um, I go to Pine Rest, and the therapist has really helped me a lot. Um, I haven't went in a while because I'm working, and I have a really good, I don't know if she's a practical nurse or kind of like a psych psychiatrist. Yes, and um, she knows how I feel about taking a lot of medications, 
So at first she started me out with Prozac 20 milligrams and then I'm up to 40 milligrams and I'm faithfully taking it. It sounds as though you've engaged in excellent self-care. And when I first started talking about how that sticks in a family, that's, that's how it does for generations. I mean, I was told when I was a little girl, about 10 years old, that my Uncle Rue had ended his life. And it's been part of my psyche ever since. So um, most 10-year-olds in the 60s didn't, didn't have to deal with that kind of thing, you know? So, yes. Oh, well, I just have more of a comment. Um, I had a really good friend. She had broken up with her boyfriend. And I don't know if she had love addiction or something, but she just cycled down and she became very suicidal. So, you know, I tried to support her and everything. But what's so baffling about it is she had three young kids and she had convinced herself that she'd, they'd be better off without her. And it's just like, you're just like, oh my God, you know, it, and she ended up hospitalized and I think it took a long time and I think, you know, she's better now, but it's just so hard to witness that because she was a beautiful person, had so much to live for. And the guy she was with was a jerk anyway, you know, I mean, it's like, it, it, it didn't even make any sense, but you know, <laughs> Ex exactly, exactly. Yeah, say that again. She didn't make it to the rational part of her brain because she was stuck between the hippocampus and the amygdala going back and forth. She was having a permanent crappy day. Yeah. Okay, last question, Kirsten. Um, I don't know if this is something you were going to touch on later in your presentation, but um, do you, could you touch on maybe the difference between like passive and like actively? Suicidal people, like maybe someone who isn't at a point where they are like, think they could go through with harming themselves, but they're like thinking about death a lot, or it's just something that's really weighing on them? Later when we have eminent warning signs. Do I need to repeat that? I think that it's as important to get them help earlier as it is later. Because they found, like, especially people with alcohol issues, and I'm not saying that your friend did, but um, with alcohol issues, they can take five minutes to plan a suicide because they're so impulsive. So you can't really take a risk. If somebody's saying that about um, their life and how they're feeling and they're showing symptoms of depression, they really need help, and they need help immediately. Did I answer your 